this video we'll be going over section 2.3 which is on a lot of identities these aren't identities like last section where we had to prove them they are just identities that we want to learn how to use their formulas um, and the topics of the identities will have the sum and difference formulas for sine and cosine uh, and we'll see there's four of them there's two for sine two for cosine one's you know one each for sum and difference they're very very similar so really it's not that much to memorize then we'll have the double angle formulas for sine cosine and tangent and the half angles and I'll talk about the tangent ones because we don't really ever do tangent except for being sine over cosine if you look them up you'll find some but you won't see me use anything besides tangent is sine over cosine but the one thing I want to mention here is that the double and half angle formulas outside of the Pythagorean identities these are the main identities that you would ever see in a future math class you might see the sum and difference formulas for sine and cosine as well but usually that is pretty far in the future of math those of you that take calculus um, but not beyond calculus for math will almost certainly see these quite a bit um, so these are very important and for that reason these are ones that I do not give you on the test you just need to memorize and know how to do them All right, but these first ones the sum and different ones I, I usually give and I will give on the test on the formula sheet as part of the test but you really need to know how to use them <clears throat> excuse me All right, so the sum and difference formulas for sine and cosine um, there are many reasons why you might actually use it uh, but really what it is is um, it's really a way to simplify the inside of a trig function um, meaning if you have like x minus pi sine of x minus pi if you have another trig function in it like sine of x times sine of x minus pi if your two angles are different it's virtually impossible to solve an equation like that you have to have all your angles inside be the same variable all right, so what you would have to do is use the, one of the sum or difference formulas. This one would be the difference formula for sine on how to simplify it. And these four formulas right here are the sum and difference formulas for sine and cosine. We have let x and y be any two angles. Then sine of x plus y, the formula for that is sine of x times cosine of y plus cosine of x times sine of y. And then sine of x minus y is exactly the same except the plus gets changed to a minus. Now cosine, cosine of x plus y, cosine of x times cosine of y minus sine of x times sine of y. And for cosine of x minus y, you'll see what gets switched is the minus gets switched to a plus. You know, the one thing I would say as far as ever using these in the future, you very well might, which is why we go over them. And I didn't want to omit, I don't want to omit something that could be very important. Um, you really want to notice the patterns here if, if you do find a need to have to memorize them in the future. You know, the sine, sum and difference formulas, they mix match the sine and cosine, sine of x, cosine of y, cosine of x, sine of y. And then the sine in between plus matches over in the inside of the other side. So x plus y we have a plus, x minus y we have a minus, everything else is the same. But the cosine identity is the cosines go together, cosine of x, cosine of y, sine of x, sine of y, they go together. And then the sine over here, the plus or minus sine, is the opposite. So x plus y has a minus, x minus y has a plus. And that's pretty much what I have written there. If you need to memorize them, it's not a bad idea. I know for a test, if you're given a formula, you don't really feel like it's necessarily a good idea to memorize, but there's a lot of patterns here to help. And some of you might find a need to have those memorized. All right, but what we want to do is just practice using these formulas, how you would go about using them. All right, the first is to rewrite a couple expressions. Um, so rewrite sine of pi over 2 minus x in terms of sine of x and cosine of x. Your answer should not have pi over 2 in it. All right, so what this means, there's usually some confusion here. What this means is that sine of x and cosine of x may be 
in your answer and you can't simplify them because right? you don't know what your x is it's just a variable but you you can't have a pi over 2 in it so we got to get rid of this right what we want to realize here is this sign we have a difference here we have a minus so we want to use our sine of x minus y formula now if you have it written down from above you can just write down what it is it's sine of x times cosine of y minus cosine of x times sine of y right. and what you all you really want to do here is identify what you're plugging in for x and y and plug it in over here all right the order matters don't let the letters bother you so in place of x we have pi over 2 I'm going to plug in pi over 2 for x and in place of y we have x as weird as that might sound that's the way it's written minus signs the order is very important we want to plug in our formula we get sine of pi over 2 for x and cosine of y which once again, for a y, we're using x minus cosine of x, which is pi over 2, times sine of y, which is, you see, there I go, wanting to write, jump ahead. But in place of y, we are using x. All right. Now, the reason why this says your answer should not have pi over 2 in it is you are not done. You need to simplify by plugging in these things. All right, what is sine of pi over 2? Sine of pi over 2 is 1. That's from the unit circle. You should know that by now. Minus cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. And now, you know, technically this isn't wrong. 1 times cosine of x minus 0 times sine of x. But whenever we multiply by 0, it goes away. And whenever we multiply by 1, it's just itself. So we're left with just cosine of x. You know, this identity is probably, you know, this isn't something you have to memorize, but the fact that sine of pi over 2 minus x equals cosine of x is pretty useful right? because this is a lot simpler than that. You'll see with the next one, they don't all simplify super well, but we'll go about um, seeing just how they simplify. All right, so the next one we have here, same idea, rewrite one of our using one of our identities this time we have cosine of x plus 11 pi over 6 in terms of sine of x and cosine of x your answer should have 11 pi over 6 in it All right, so pretty much the same idea you might have a sine of x you might have a cosine of x in your answer but you better not have 11 pi over 6 All right so this one looks a lot like cosine of x plus y we got cosine and a plus and like i said you know, just write down your identity. That's really what you want to do here. Cosine of x plus y equals cosine of x times cosine of y minus sine of x times sine of y. And we can see for x, we should use x, which is nice. It's not weird like last time where we're using a different letter. And for in place of y, we want to put 11 pi over 6. Right, so let's go ahead and plug that in. We get cosine of x times cosine of 11 pi over 6 minus sine of x times sine of 11 pi over 6. And then if you... I have cosine of 11 pi over 6. That is the square root of 3 over 2. 11 pi over 6 is in quadrant 4, so it's positive, and the reference angle is pi over 6. So that is the small one. That's where cosine is the biggest. Then we get minus sine of x, and sine in quadrant 4 is negative, and when its reference angle is pi over 6, we get 1 half. Once again, this is all old stuff from the unit circle. If you're unsure about these numbers, you know, look back at the other videos, think about how we did it. All right, but then simplifying, it's really up to you how far to simplify. The one thing I definitely want to see, though, we have a minus and a minus here. When they multiply them, it becomes a plus. 
So at bare minimum, you should write that as a plus. And because we are multiplying, multiplying the fractions, we get over two. Now, if we just finish multiplying, or sorry, not multiplying, we already multiplied. If we finish combining them, they already have a common denominator. So it's really not much extra work to finish up. We get cosine of x times square root of three plus sine of x all over two. Right. Now, like I said, this is fine. You should simplify at least to here, but because it's already your, have a common denominator, which you're almost always gonna have, this is good. All right, so the next thing is practicing these formulas in a different way. Um, another way is now we can find the exact values of some sine and cosine. We could do tangent, but we won't. Uh, but we can find the exact values of sine and cosine of different angles now. Right. The example I have written up here, just to preview, is the angle 15 degrees, since it can be written as 45 minus 30 degrees, which are both on the unit circle. We can figure out using one of our identities. For example, if when we get down to it, but if we wanted to figure out sine of 15 degrees, we could do sine of 45 minus 30. We would use x as 45 and y as 30 in our formula. But we'll go ahead and jump into it because you know that's exactly what we're about to do although it's 75 degrees we want to find the exact value of sine of 75 degrees All right once again this means no decimals you're going to have radicals or fractions or something but no decimals if you type this in your calculator that doesn't count All right so what we want to do is write our angle as the sum or difference of two angles on the unit circle Meaning, can we write 75 degrees as two angles added together or two angles subtracted that are both on the unit circle? And the answer to that is yes. In fact, almost always, you, if you think about 45 degrees, what is the missing one to get to 75? That's a way to do it. So 45 degrees plus 30 degrees equals 75 degrees. Um, it's pretty hard to come up with an example using this where you can't use 45 as one of them because if you just add 30 and 60 you get 90 and that's already on the unit circle as well. So I'll write almost because I won't say 100% certain it's always but almost always you can use one angle as 45 degrees when you do this. Right. But the idea is this, seven, sine of 75 degrees, right? It's not sine of 45 degrees plus sine of 30 degrees, it's sine of 45 degrees plus 30 degrees like this, right? We're just substituting in 75 is 45 plus 30. And then we want to use the appropriate identity. This is like sine of x minus y. Sorry, not minus, that's clearly a plus. Sine of x plus y, which equals sine of x times cosine of y plus cosine of x times sine of y. And we want to replace x with 45 degrees, since that's what's in front, and y with 30 degrees, which is in back. Okay. But once you do that, the reason why you have to use these unit circle values is you're going to be able to figure out all of these things from the unit circle. So we plug in 45 degrees, we got sine of 45 degrees. We plug in 30 degrees for y, we got cosine of 30 degrees, plus cosine of 45 degrees times sine of 30 degrees. Now, sine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 30 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. Plus, 
cosine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2. And sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. So sine of 30, 30 degrees is the small one. So that's where sine is small and cosine is big. 45 degrees is where they match. All right. But once you're here, you've pretty much done most of the work. You just want to simplify this. Multiply comes before addition. Multiplication comes before addition. So we multiply our fractions here. Square root of 2 times square root of 3 is the square root of 6 over 2 times 2, which is 4. Plus square root of 2 times 1 is the square root of 2 over 2 times 2, which again is 4. Now, one thing I will mention that I see quite a bit is um, just trying to do too many steps at once. People see these common denominators and just leave it as 2. But when you're multiplying fractions, you got to multiply the bottoms and the tops. It doesn't matter if they're the same or different. But once we're here, we can combine this into one fraction because we've already got a common denominator of 4. We get the square root of 6 plus the square root of 2 over 4. And this cannot be simplified. You cannot add fractions together, sorry, radicals together, unless if they have the same number inside and then you just put like a 2 or something in front. But the square, uh, adding two square roots together where, when the inside's not the same is not possible to simplify. All right. Do not write square root of 6 plus square root of 2 does not equal the square root of 8, okay? I'm sure you're well aware of that, but it's sometimes when you're told to simplify something, you, especially in this section, we have a lot of messy looking answers, and this is simplified. Pretty much all the exact values of the problems like this are going to look something like this. They're not going to look very pretty, but that's what they're going to be. Now you can check your answer just like we did before. So let's figure out what is sine of 75 degrees. I've got to make sure I'm in degree mode. We got sine of 75 degrees. And then our answer that we had was the square root of 6. Plus the square root of 2. And then that was divided by 4. And you can see they do match, so we are good to go. Right. Now I only have one other one here because they all boil down to being the same. You have to write your angle as the sum or difference of two. Use the appropriate formula. But one thing I like to mention when people see radians, you know, even you'll hear from me, I wouldn't recommend trying to do this with radians. What I would recommend is switching this to degrees and then just do it to degrees, with degrees. Because it's pretty hard to use the idea of writing this fraction in terms of two angles on the unit circle in degrees because of the fraction. So switch to degrees, then do it like above. And we've, we know how to switch to degrees. That's pretty much the first thing we did in this class was switching from degrees and radians. We multiply by 180 degrees over pi. The pi's cancel out. And if you multiply these numbers, 13 times 180 over 12, you should get 195. All right, so even though it's asked to find this, we can just think about sine of 195 degrees. It is the same angle. It doesn't matter if we switch it to degrees because this is what we're figuring out. Okay. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to write 195 degrees as a sum or difference of two angles on the unit circle. And like I mentioned before, especially when these angles get kind of big, it's not obvious. But if you use one of them as 45 degrees, the other one it really is guaranteed that it has to be on the unit circle. And if you look on the unit circle, you will see that 150 is there. Okay. So we got sine of 45 degrees 
plus 150 degrees. We actually used the same identity last time because it's a sum of sine. If it was cosine, we would use that. If it was a difference, we'd use the appropriate one. But this is sine of x, sine of 45 degrees, times cosine of y, cosine of 150 degrees, plus cosine of x, cosine of 45 degrees, times sine of y, sine of 150 degrees. And now we go through and simplify. Sine of 45 degrees is the square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 150 degrees. 150 degrees is in quadrant 2. I guess I'll just go ahead and point that out. So cosine is negative. The reference angle is 30 degrees, which is the small one. So that's where its cosine is big. So it says negative square root of 3 over 2 plus cosine of 45 degrees square root of 2 over 2 times sine of 150 degrees, sine is positive in quadrant two, and the reference angle of 30 is where it's small. <clears throat> but once again, you kind of see a similar type of answer here. We'll just go ahead and simplify the same way. Multiply square root of two times negative square root of three is negative square root of six over two times two, which is four, plus square root of two times one is the square root of two, over 2 times 2, which is 4. And once again, you're going to have that common denominator because of the way the unit circle works and everything. Just add these together and put it over your common denominator of 4. Um, but one good thing to bring up about the end result of this problem, the negative sign here must go on the top, on the square root of 6. I have seen people that will have a negative sign out front and they'll throw it out front of the fraction. But what that means is you'd have to distribute it to both. So you, this negative sign has to go on the top, has to be up here. It cannot be out front. And if you put it out front, it means something out means something else. All right, but overall, this is the sum and difference identities, practicing them, making sure you know how to work with them. All right, the next thing is the double angle formulas. The double angle formulas for sine and cosine, and then tangent, which I'll mention is just dividing sine over cosine. But the reason why these would come next in order is they really do come from the sum and difference. I have it kind of written out here. If you take the sum formula for sine but replace x with y, sine of 2x equals sine of x plus x. But if you boil down and write out and simplify, it equals 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. Okay, so the areas I have highlighted are what it equals. Sine of 2x equals 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. These are called your double angle formulas because of the 2 here. If you want to double your angle, you know what's happening at the regular angle, x, and then this is how you figure out where it's happening at 2x. Uh, the way you get cosine of 2x identity is the same. You take our sum formula, plug in y for x, and go from there. So if we plug in x for the cosine of x, we get cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. Now one thing I, I like to do here, because when you look up the double angle formulas for cosine, you'll always see three. Um, the way these other two come about is by using the Pythagorean identity. So this first one here happens if you plug in, which I have written here, you plug in 1 minus cosine squared of x for sine squared of x. And then the second one, you take the original, and then if you plug in for cosine squared of x, 1 minus sine squared of x, you'll get this one.
Right. It is highly beneficial to learn all three. However, I think, you know, it's kind of funny to me that the normal double angle formula is this, the cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x, but you pretty much only ever use these bottom two. You don't really use this first one very much. So you'll see in problems, I'll use these two, but I won't really use this one because it's not that used. Right. One of the easy reasons to explain that is you don't have to figure out sine and cosine, you just have to figure out one of them to use this formula. Which, which is pretty much uh, what I have written here. Uh, the one note I have for the double formula for tangent of x, tangent sine over cosine, so you, in all the problems, you'll have to figure out all three. Once you figure out sine of 2x and cosine of 2x, you just divide them, you get tangent of 2x. Right? You don't have to memorize a formula for tangent of 2x, and you know, the less formulas you have to memorize, the better. Right? But there isn't a lot of ways to necessarily practice this formula without saying just memorize it. Uh, this is a good problem, though. So what we are told is if sine of x is negative 1 7th and x is in quadrant 3, we want to determine the exact values of sine of 2x, cosine of 2x, and below, which I just scrolled down to show you, is tangent of 2x. Right, but what you want to do is draw a picture with a right triangle for this. One thing I will mention since it's in the quadrant, remember what we talked about when we introduced doing this right triangle stuff, is you want to make sure you draw in the correct quadrant and have make the correct values positive and negative. So we'll go ahead and do that. Right. We don't have to label angles here. We're not figuring out any angles. What we want to do is draw our angle in quadrant 3. Make a right triangle. Just like we did before. So this is our angle X. It's really the whole thing, but you know, it's not it's kind of useless to write draw in this part, so I'm going to actually, you know, get rid of that. But we are in the third quadrant, and we are told sine of x is negative 1 7. Right. So remember, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And this is telling us the opposite side is negative 1. That negative makes sense because y is negative here, and the hypotenuse is 7. All right, the reason why we want to draw this is we want to figure out cosine of x. The reason we want cosine of x is because the identity of sine of 2x. Right? The reason we want this, the identity for sine of 2x is 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. So we need both sine of x and cosine of x. Right, so we've got to figure out this missing side. You can call it A or whatever you want. We have a right triangle. If we want to figure out the missing side, we do our Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus negative 1 squared equals 7 squared. Negative 1 squared is 1. 7 squared is 49. Subtract the 1, we get A squared is 48. Then we do the square root to get A. One thing you definitely want to notice here, A is this side, but it's on the negative x-axis, so it's going to be negative. Okay, so just point that out to yourself. And when we simplify, we get A equals negative square root of 48. And can we simplify the square root? Yes, we can, because 48 is 16 times 3. So the square root of 16 times the square root of 3 and the square root of 16 is 4. All right. A lot of the times when you do these problems figuring out this part, which is a problem we've done before, is the longest part. The rest just becomes plugging in to the formula.
But now you can write down what cosine of x is, which is what I would do before I use my formula. Cosine of x is adjacent over hypotenuse, negative 4 times the square root of 3 over 7. All right, but what we go ahead and do now is we want to plug in. We have sine of x and we have cosine of x. We plug them in. Don't forget about the 2, though. We got 2 times sine of x is negative 1 7th. Cosine of x is negative 4 times the square root of 3 over 7. This is all multiplication, so simplify, multiply all the tops out. The negative and negative make a plus. 2 times 1 times 4 is 8. So we get 8 times the square root of 3. And if we multiply the bottom, 7 times 7 is 49. So sine of 2x is 8 times the square root of 3 times divided by 49. This is the only way to do it and get the exact value. You, there would be necessarily a way to do it in your calculator to get a decimal because you could figure out what x is, multiply it by 2, and then do sine of that. But that's not what we're going for here. That's not going to work because it's not going to give your exact value. All right Now, cosine of 2x is the identity that has many forms, three forms. What I would say, especially because we're given sine of x here, is use the one with sine of square root of x in it and not cosine square root of x. Now, you can use the one with just cosine square root of x. You can use the one with both, but this is just the easiest way to do it because the number is simpler. So the one with sine square root of x is 1 minus 2 times sine square root of x. Now, if we plug it in, we got 1 minus 2. And in place of sine of x, we got negative 1 seventh. And we're going to square that. Now simplify, we got 1 minus 2 times square negative, it becomes a positive, we get 1 over 49. Keep simplifying here. We get 1 minus, multiply this, we get 2 over 49. And then this, if we get a common denominator, we get 49 over 49 minus 2 over 49 is 47 over 49. Okay, so, so cosine of 2x is that. Now finally the last one, tangent of 2x. Once you have sine of 2x and cosine of 2x, you just divide them. You do not need to learn a different identity for this. There's really no reason to. While they exist, they're really never used for that reason. So sine of 2x, we, what we got from the first part, we got 8 times the square root of 3 over 49. Cosine of 2x, we got 47 over 49. Do our keep change flip because we have a fraction in the bottom. So we keep the, bot, the, keep the top change division to multiplication and flip the bottom and just like what happened with tangent before you may have seen it right away the 49s cancel out we could have canceled them out here but i know it's been a while since we did that so i didn't want to do it right away but then we've got eight times the square root of three on the top and 47 on the bottom And that is tangent of 2x for this angle. Right, now, one thing to keep in mind is I really recommend doing it the way I did it. Figure out sine and figure out cosine. You know, most of your work is in here. You have to remember those identities. But I really can't recommend enough not worrying about an identity for tangent of 2x.
right. So another thing, because these are the most I most important identities, is just rewriting um, and simplifying expressions with that involve these um, double angle identities. And one thing I'll note here on the problem below, you can might be able to see how the problems are written or what their answer will be or what we're going to use. But since the double angle formula for cosine has three forms, you may need to be on the lookout for any of the three. So the first one we have here, the directions say rewrite each of the following as a single trig function using a double angle identity. So what we have here is we're multiplying sine and cosine. The one that you want to think about immediately is the double angle for sine because that's where it is, the double angle identity for sine. I don't need to write angle twice. I meant to write identity. All right, so let's go ahead. I'm just going to write down the identity. Sine of 2x equals 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. Now, what you want to notice about this is this sine of 3y, cosine of 3y, the angle is different than just x, but they are the same. That's important. It's really a lot like this, except with x equals 3y. Right. Now what the directions want you to do is simplify this, write it as one thing. So what, what you want to do is get rid of this 2 and we'll divide this 2 on each side. So we get sine of 2x over 2 equals sine of x times cosine of x. And then just like I have written here, if we plug in 3y, we'll get the right side right here is going to be what we're given, and we'll know what it equals. Okay, So we plug in 3y for x. We get sine of 6y over 2. Because right? if we plug in 3y, 2 times 3 will give us the 6 we get sine of 3y cosine of 3y. And this would be the answer. What This is what it's asking for. Rewrite each of the following as a single trig function using a double angle identity. So our angle got doubled. Because we were missing the 2 there, we saw how to fix that. We divide and get the 2 on the other side. So that's one with the double angle identity for sine, but it's pretty common to see in a calculus class, and dealing with this is a lot easier than dealing with this. Uh, the next one, you could probably guess, is going to be one for cosine, and it definitely looks a lot like cosine because this has cosine squared and a sine squared in it. So it looks like the formula we use, cosine of 2x equals cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. And what's going on here in place of x? We have 6 beta. Right? If we had 6 beta written here, this would be cosine squared of 6 beta minus sine squared of 6 beta, exactly this side. So if we plug in exactly that, plug in x equals 6 beta, we get cosine, the left side, if we put 6 beta here times the 2 will give us 12 beta, equals cosine squared of 6 beta minus sine squared of 6 beta. Right, and you can see now this is what we started with, this is what, it e um, what we're trying to simplify, so our answer is cosine 
of 12 beta. Okay, that's what it simplifies to. All right, but that's also another very common way to use these double angle identities. Um, and like I said, it's really important that, especially for those of you that are going to take calculus, that you memorize these because these, along with the Pythagorean identities, are the main ones. All right, so the last thing we have here is about the half angle. Sometimes they're called the power reducing formulas for sine, cosine, and tangent. Um, so what I have here in this section, um, I just have the formulas for you. I'll, I'll talk about where they come from, but I'll show you how to get them at the end of the video. It's just some algebra dealing with the, um, the double angle formula for cosine using the last two. But I know it's not necessarily on the top of everyone's radar. Right, but you do need to write these down. The reason these are called the half angle identities is because the angle that is solved for has x over two or half of the x. And just like with the last one, if you wanna get tangent of x over two, you should just figure out sine of x over two and cosine of x over two, then divide them. So one thing that I have mentioned here that is you, you'll notice in the formulas, you see this plus or minus, it comes from doing the square root when you solve for it. Because you have a plus or minus there, you're gonna have to choose the correct one at some point. And we'll see with the problem we do, how you do that. So that's why I have this highlighted. This is an important fact here to keep in mind. You can only have one answer, plus or minus, indirectly says you have two answers and you cannot have two. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to do now, I'm going to just write down the formulas again so you can see what we need. Sine of x over 2 is this plus or minus square root of 1 minus cosine of x over 2. And cosine of x over 2, it, it looks exactly the same but with a plus inside instead of a minus. All right, one thing I guess I, I brushed over here, but the two is inside the square root. The entire thing is inside the square root. Right. So when you use this formula, it's not just the numerator inside the square root, the entire thing is. Right, but what you'll notice here from the identity formula is we need cosine of x. Right. We need cosine of x to use this identity. We have sine of x. For this problem, we are given if sine of x equals negative 1, 6, and x is in quadrant 3, determine the exact values. So how are we going to figure out sine of x? You know, it pretty much exactly like we did with the double angle. We're just using a different formula. Draw our picture. We have our angle x is in quadrant 3. We are told that sine of x is negative 1 6, which means our opposite side is negative 1 and our hypotenuse is 6. And we need cosine of x, so we got to figure out A. Right, and we solve for a exactly like last time. We got the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus negative one squared equals six squared. One, negative one squared is one, six squared is 36. We subtract the one from each side, we get a squared equals 35. And then we do the square root. Once again, because a is on the negative x-axis, it's negative. We get a equals the negative square root of 35. And this time we can't simplify this because 35 doesn't have a perfect square and as a factor. But cosine of x then adjacent over hypotenuse is negative square root of 35 over six. 
All right. What you want to do when you do these, um, just start by plugging in what cosine of x is. It's going to look a little messy initially. Uh, but another thing you want to do is make a choice. Do we choose positive or negative? So these ident this identity, even though it's going to look messy, is you know not really as bad to work with as the double angles because the formulas are so similar. If you remember one, you pretty much remember both. The hard part for most people is do we choose the plus or the minus? And what that comes from is knowing where x is. So. But we don't only use where x is, we have to use where x over 2 is. Okay. All right, so since x is in quadrant 3, all right, quadrant 3 is between the angles. If you think about degrees, it's between 180 and 270 degrees. All right, now the, the tricky part is if you see quadrant three, you just might want to use the negative because sine is negative in quadrant three, but you have to pay attention that we're looking at the angle x over two. We want to ask the question, what quadrant is x over two in? Well, if you divide everything in here by two, we get 90 degrees is less than or equal to x over two, which is less than or equal to 270 divided by is 135 degrees. Right. Well, where is x over 2? If it's between 90, which is the positive y-axis, and 135, it's somewhere in quadrant 2. Right. It's between 90 and 135, so it's only in part of quadrant 2, but the real question we're trying to answer is what quadrant it's in. It's in quadrant 2. And in quadrant two, sine is positive. And in quadrant two, cosine is negative. Okay. So you do have to make that choice. And you want to do it this way. If you know what quadrant x is in, you know what two angles it's between, then you divide by two and figure out what quadrant that is in. But we made our choice. We choose the plus for sine. Since we chose the plus, I'm not going to write it. And we have cosine of x to plug in negative square root of 35 over 6. And then that's all over 2. The minus minus gets switched to a plus. So we got 1 plus the square root of 35 over 6. And then that's all over 2. Now we get a common denominator up top. All right, we want to get a common denominator right here. And we would change 1 to 6 over 6. We'd multiply it by 6 over 6. Okay, so I'm just going through every little step here to get this. 6 over 6 plus the square root of 35 over 6. And then that's over 2 because all we did was we got a common denominator here. Now continue simplifying. We got our common denominator. We can add these together. So we got 6 plus the square root of 35 over 6. And then that's the top. The bottom is just 2. All right. So when you're dividing by a number, that number is just going to go to the frat denominator here. So really, we're going to have 6 plus the square root of 35 over 6 times 2, which is 12. And as crazy as it sounds, this is the simplified answer. These really don't simplify much. 
which is a little, you know, unwelcoming, but it's just the way it is. Right? When you use these half angle identities, the answers don't simplify very much. Right, but let's just keep that a little bit separated from the rest of our work. Now, one thing I'll say, because these identities are so similar, you notice the difference is the plus and the minus. If you work through this entire thing, all that's going to change is this middle sign. Right? So if you work through the whole thing, you will get 6 minus the square root of 35 over 12 inside. So I'm going to start by just plugging in the cosine of x, what we have. Don't forget we're choosing the minus here, but then the inside will just switch this plus to a minus because in the identity, the difference is this sign here. Everything else is the same. It can save you a lot of time when you're doing these on the homework. So we choose our minus, don't forget about that. We got the square root, we got one plus, and then cosine of x is negative square root of 35 over six, and that's all over two. Now the reason why this became a plus last time at the end is because we had minus minus, which made a plus. This plus minus stays a minus, and we get, we'll end up with 6 minus the square root of 35 over 12. Okay. So it becomes exactly the same as the previous one, except the sign inside changes. But one thing you don't want to forget is the negative that we had from the quadrant stuff. So we're just going to make an arrow. Same inside but with different SIG and sign in the middle. Because these identities are like this, they all work out like this. There's not going to be one that has a special difference. All right now, finally, tangent of x over 2. To wrap this section up, tangent of x over 2 is equal to sine of x over 2 over cosine of x over 2. And that sine of x over 2 is what we got in part a, the square root of 6 plus the square root of 35 over 12. Over cosine of x over 2, we got negative square root of 6 minus the square root of 35 over 12. Now what's going to happen here is ha what happens in all tangent identities. The bottom parts, the denominators of each fraction will cancel because they are the same, 12 and 12. The tops don't cancel at all because there's a plus and a minus. They're different. But we have the minus sign out front. We can just move that out front. Don't forget about that. Then on the top, we have the square root of 6 plus 35, the square root of 35. And the bottom, we have the square root of 6 minus the square root of 35. It's terribly messy, but this is simplified final answer. If you want, you can write it all in one square root. But other than that, you know, there is a way to simplify this a little bit, but it's still messy. This is plenty simplified. You don't have to go any further than this. So that is this section. We have, you know, eight formulas. Go away. We have eight formulas for that you need to memorize the double and well, I guess there's kind of six because there's three for the double angle for a cosine. But the double and half angle formulas you need to memorize in order and use them. And the sum and difference formulas need you need to learn how to use them. But you will be given those. All right now, this last bit, I'm just going to derive the half angle formulas for sine and cosine. If you don't want to watch this, I understand, but those of you, I know some people are always interested in this stuff, and I don't want to leave you hanging. 
All right, so remember these come from the double angle formulas for cosine. And I'll do the one with uh, cosine first. So we got cosine of 2x equals 2 cosine squared of x minus 1. If you want to derive this formula, what you can do is solve for cosine of x here. All right, so we add 1 to each side. We get cosine of 2x plus 1 equals 2 cosine squared of x. And then we divide each side by 2 to get rid of that 2. So we've got, I'm going to rewrite this as 1 plus 2, or 1 plus cosine of 2x over 2, just to make it match the identity more. The order of addition doesn't matter. Now, to finish solving for cosine of x, we got to do the square root. When we do the square root, we do our plus and minus on the other side. And we got plus or minus the square root of 1 plus cosine of 2x over 2. And that equals cosine of x. Now, our identity, it looks a little different here. It looks like it has the same format, for, but different. The identity that we have above is gotten by replacing x with x over 2. Right? This is technically a half angle identity because angle x is half of angle 2x. But if you want to make it look more like that, then we replace 2x with x or x with x over 2, either one. They're equivalent. And we get our identity this one for cosine. Right. Now the one for sine, you work out the same way. You just use the double angle identity for cosine, which has the sine squared in it only. So we got cosine of 2x equals 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. And you start by solving for sine of x. We're going to do the same exact thing. But it's nice to see that they are so similar and how it actually is so similar. You're not just told it. So we subtract the 1 from each side. Subtract the 1. We get cosine of 2x minus 1 equals negative 2 sine squared of x. Then we divide each side by that negative 2. So we got cosine of 2x minus 1 over negative 2 equals sine squared of x. One thing I'm going to do here is just move the negative up top, which is going to switch the signs here. So if I want to get rid of that negative, I can kind of think about multiplying it by negative 1. If I multiply by negative 1 on top to save it, it switches the order. And once again, just to make it look like our identity, that's really what I'm doing. Then to get sine from sine squared, we do the square root and the plus or minus. So we get plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cosine of 2x over 2 equals sine of x. And if you want to finish up like I did last time just to see the half angle working, you replace the x with x over 2. We get 1 minus cosine of x over 2 equals sine of x over 2. Right, but those are the half angle identities and that's where they come from. If you wanted to see where the sum and difference identities come from, they are very messy algebra, but your book does it. If you are interested, you can look in the book.
but it's something that would probably take me about 45 minutes in the video and I don't think any of us want that. 